Safety, this is Commander Rick. Coming up on TVO. These are involved in making decisions more and more. You're watching TVO. Time waits for no man. You can't live in the past. Que sera, sera. Popular sayings, not in science fiction. With time machines, SF authors can fly forward to the future, pop into the past, or even get caught in a closed time loop. Hit it, Nancy. Or even get caught in a closed time loop. Hit it, Nancy. Or even get caught in a closed time loop. Hit it, Nancy. Or even go into the past and change things to produce a slightly different future. Hit it, Helen. Anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe. Here's a vote and the English only sign. 40,000 tons of oil with PCBs blew up the ozone layer today. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Time travel. In speculative fiction, it's easy. For example, in Mark Twain's hilarious 1889 novel, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, a foreman at a weapons factory is bonked on the noggin, comes to in the age of chivalry, and discovers it's really the age of pig ignorance. Probably the first intentional time trip was taken in H.G. Wells' 1895 classic, The Time Machine. A Victorian inventor flies forward to the fall of civilization and beyond. Then, in 1941, the fall of the Roman Empire served as the setting for L. Sprague de Camp's classic, Lest Darkness Fall. Why did you send your hero, Martin Padway, back to 6th century Rome? Oh, I'd been reading a lot on what Toynbee called the post-Roman interregnum, the period of chaos after the fall of the West Roman Empire. And uh, I'd also read uh, Graves' novel, Count Belisarius, and was very much uh, hooked by it. So I thought, well, someday I ought to write a story in that setting. And uh, then I put in the time travel element when I, because I knew it was, my market was uh, the science fiction magazines. And uh, Less Darkness Fall resulted. One of Padway's biggest problems is that the Romans all speak 6th century Latin. Now, three years before Less Darkness Fall, you penned an article about the problems of dealing with different languages and early versions of one's native tongue. How far back could I go before I'd have problems understanding English? Well, um, if you went back to the time of, let us say, George Washington, you would... Uh, Note that the English was uh, or orally different from what it is today, but it would still be understandable. And uh, if you went back to Shakespeare's time, your English would be barely understandable by a well-educated uh, Briton. And of course, if you went back to the time of Chaucer, it would be completely unintelligible. Juan that a prilla with a sure sort of the drucht of marcha person told the rota and by that every vine in switch liqueur of which vertiu engender it is the floor. I can go on like that, but I'll <laughs> spare the TV audience. If Berlitz had courses for time travelers, the most popular would probably be the language Jesus hath spake. Nancy, that would be Hebrew or ah. Well, the pilgrimage to Palestine is popular in SF. 
in The Man Who Folded Himself, David Gerald's time traveler witnessed the crucifixion, and the character Carl Glogauer becomes more than a witness in Michael Moorcock's 1966 Nebula award-winning novella, Behold the Man, which Moorcock later expanded to novel length. Michael, why is time travel so compelling? It allows you to bring different periods of history together and make comparisons and see what happens and see where the similarities are. It en enables you to analyze your situations, your social situation, I think. That's its main interest to me, the use of time travel. Right. It's simply its literary uses, its literary possibilities. Um, science fiction in general interested me for that reason, what you could do with it, what you could do with the symbols it provided, um, rather than the, you know, the you know, one day man will walk on the moon, which never really meant much to me, still doesn't. So what were your literary motives for sending Carl Glogauer back to Christ's crucifixion in Behold the Man? I was actually thinking about demagogues and how they're created by the people who want them to exist. So it was important to me to find a demagogue that, that really was kind of, you know, had quite a powerful effect on the world. And that way also you can examine the, you know, the religion itself, or at least the, the, the underlying sort of principle of, of it itself. So that was what it was. I mean, it, it, I thought about one Easter, you know, it came to me one Easter. I thought, um, it could have been Hitler, as it were. It could have been any other great demagogue. But obviously Christ is more... You know, more important to us all than Hitler, I hope. Um, most of us, at any rate. And, and it, it just seemed the obvious thing to do. I, I really didn't, you know, I didn't think I was doing anything particularly different or unusual. I really didn't, until I started getting the death threats. You know, then I understood that it had a certain significance for people <laughs> that I didn't understand. One critic noted that if Behold the Man had been written in the past, Michael might have been crucified. But is time travel really possible? To find out, I took time to call science fiction writer John Gribben, who also hosts a BBC World Service radio program called Science or Fiction. And he has a new non-fiction book on time travel called Unveiling the Edge of Time. I asked John, is time travel theoretically possible? If you actually look into the equations of general relativity, which is the best description of the universe we've got, the best description of space and time, you find that there's nothing there which says that you can't travel backwards in time or that you can't send a message backwards in time. And the way the scientists got into studying this was because, in fact, it was Carl Sagan who, who was writing his book Contact who wanted to put wormholes, as they're called, into the story. And he got in touch with Kip Thorne, who's sort of the world guru on general relativity, and asked him, look, I know this is impossible, but can you dress it up for me in some fine-sounding language to make a good story? And Kip and his students went into it. They looked at the equations, and they sort of struck themselves a metaphorical blow on the head and said, my god, you know, you can build these things. There's nothing to forbid them. And so it, it was literally an idea from science fiction which stimulated the research by the relativists, which led them to find that you can uh, construct these things which are like uh, two black holes joined by a tunnel through good old hyperspace, the thing we've all read about in science fiction for years and years, and jump in one end and pop out the other one last Thursday or in the year 5 BC or whenever it might be. Now, it's very difficult, you know. I mean, the practical problems of building something like this are immense. He's not kidding. No one's even proved black holes exist. Kip Thorne, the relativity guru, has a bet with physicist Stephen Hawking on whether or not the binary star Cygnus 1 is a black hole. The winner gets a subscription to Private Eye or Penthouse. Oh, I know. Dr. Gregory Benford is a physicist and a science fiction writer, and in his 1980 Nebula award-winning novel, Timescape, he sidestepped wormholes and still sounded convincing. Ah, oh, Greg, it's Commander Rick. Can you explain how in Timescape, the character Gregory Markham concludes that time travel is possible because the equations of physics are time symmetric? 